last week we are in a uh, we're in a series called Theology. Um, where we broke it down. It's the theology is just the study of God or things about God. And last week we just asked the question, who is God? And some of the, the answers we came to was the idea that he is eternal, like he exists outside of time. He is the creator. He made you in his image. He is a heavenly father. Um, and then we, we kind of rolled out of that. And so this week we're asking a second question. And it's probably the one that the whole premise of our faith is built on. So if you're if you are a follower, you are somebody who who's like, I, I believe in Jesus, like this maybe you might answer some questions where you're like, I've done this thing, but I still don't know, like, you know, logistically, mechanics, how does this all work? Uh, some of you might be like a little bit skeptical, you're like, my friend keeps telling me that I need to be saved, and I don't know from what. Like, Mrs. Smith is not trying to eat me in math class. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. We're good, you know? It's not the Avengers. There's no Avengers level threat outside. Um, we're talking about a spiritual salvation. So this, this might help answer those questions. And then if you are entirely like this, I'm foreign to church. I'm foreign to Jesus. Who is Jesus? You know, um, man, I just encourage you to listen with, with kind of an open ear. And you might learn something new. You might feel a tug at your heart, and it might help you understand some of the people, especially my FCA peeps in here. <laughs> Y'all, they, they're, they're not revival. I'm going to be here. You better be here. Um, it's going to be good. So we're asking the question tonight, what is salvation? What is salvation? Our whole faith is predicated on this idea of being saved. And of course, the question is like, what am I being saved from? And what does that mean? And does it last? Do I need to renew it? It's like subscription, like an Xbox, like every year I got to like get resaved, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's where we're kind of going. And tonight we're just going to use one passage. I just, I'm way more comfortable with that. Last week we kind of bounced all over the Bible and some of y'all probably got really confused because you were like, I was in Deuteronomy and then y'all threw me in Jude. Okay. Some of y'all go. Learn where Jude is. Also, Israel, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever should perish, should not perish. Sorry, whoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Sorry, splash up. Yeah. I also messed up on that verse. Sorry, it is. Um, I had to rise the King James, and you try to translate it, and you're like, yeah. So, that's where we're going tonight. We're going to be in Romans 3. So, if you got your Bible with you, we're going to be in Romans Three. Let me give you some quick context in the letter of Romans. Also, if you don't know where it is, take your book, take the Bible, start it in the back. Or if you're on your phone, you can just scroll and search it. I see phones only. Come on. Nobody with me? Like, no, you're good. Be on your phone. Like, go find it. Like, yes, William in the back. Love it. So, you start in the back, and then you eventually flip. He's like over here waving it. There's a light. And I'm like, ah! Right? Can't see anything. So Romans is right after the four Gospels, and then right after the four Gospels is the book of Acts, and then Romans immediately follows up Acts. Romans is written by the Apostle Paul, who's probably the greatest Christian missionary, especially in the early church. And so he writes this long letter to the house churches in Rome. And Rome was the last place that Paul journeyed to. Uh, over the course of his missionary journeys, he was always trying to get to Rome. He finally gets there. That's where we get books like 1 and 2 Timothy. We know this because some of the language he uses where he's like, Timothy, I'm near the end of my life. And you're like, okay, so he's almost dead. Um, that's just how it goes. When you get old, you die, whatever. So he's writing these, these letters, and he writes this one to the Romans. And what's really cool to me about Romans, aside from the fact that it's really full of doctrine, and if you're a nerd like I am, you're like, that's cool. What's cooler to me is that he uses lawyer-type language. And so if you didn't know this, there are law schools that will actually bring in the letter to Romans and will teach lawyers how to examine it and learn from it and teach law to them in that way. That's like how impressive Paul's writing was 2,000 years ago. Let that sink in. Like we're still using that in law class. Anybody want to be a lawyer in here? Lawyer people? Okay, a couple of y'all. Okay, there you go. Start studying. There you go. Start studying Romans. I'm really good at it. So we're picking up in chapter 3, verse 9. Um, he is beginning off the letter of Romans by kind of bringing everybody into an equal playing field as he then is going to begin this kind of conversation on what is salvation. So verse 9, what then? Are we any better off? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. So first, Paul is writing from a Jewish perspective. That's what Paul was. He was a Jew. And what is happening is the Jews believed themselves to be like of a greater value 
than the Greeks or the Gentiles, depending on how your Bible translates it, which is basically everybody else. So for a lot of us in the room, we are the everybody else category. And the Jews were like, no, 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 we're, we're better than them because we're God's chosen people. And, you know, the law and all this. And, and Paul's like, yeah, but you all miss Jesus. And hang up a second, quit. You're also still sinners. And so he spends most of chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3 getting both the Greeks to acknowledge, yep, we're sinners, and the Jews to acknowledge, yep, we miss Jesus, and kind of brings them together. In a way, he's fighting racism at the same time. because He's putting everybody on equal playing field. And so there's this idea, this common ground of sin. I know, I'm starting off on a heavy foot. Sin, but what does the word actually mean? So the sin is the Greek word hamartia. Say it with me. Hamartia. Say it again. Hamartia. Okay, so it's a Greek word that means to err, or really it's an archery term, to miss the mark. That's not too bad, right? We always hear sin and we're like, mm, gross, just means to miss the mark. But there's a follow-up question. You have to ask, what is the mark? And Paul helps clarify that in their letter to the, the church at Ephesians. In, one, in, in chapter 1, verse 4, he says that even before even the world was formed, God's intentions for you and I and everybody in it was to be holy and blameless. To be holy and blameless. Adam and Eve, when they start out in Genesis 1, are holy and blameless. God literally can move into their presence and walk with them. And then they get duped by the enemy and they sin. And because they fell short, unfortunately, they were removed from the garden and from God's presence. You see, sin is the thing that makes us require a savior. Sin is the thing which causes us to need a savior because it removes us from God's presence. God's holiness means that we can't be in, he can't be in the presence with sin because he's perfect. And as some of you know, it only takes one thing. You know, if you've got a pair of shoes, right? No, they're, they're perfect. What happens when you scuff them? Cry. I cry. That's a good, yeah. But they're no longer what? No longer perfect. Can you ever get them back to perfect? Yes. Maybe. Well, okay, it's perfect in way, but you can maybe get them back, but you can never fully just clap like it was. And I'm like one of those that's like super OCD about this stuff where like, I know where I hid the blemish. Like, I know you can't see, but like, I know where it is. And I'm always like, man, those, those are so nice. And I scuffed them. So it requires that we have a Savior. And so the mark is holiness and blameless. So I want you to think about for a moment just the last 24 hours of your life, mine included. Have they been holy? about blameless? Have your thoughts been pure? Your actions good? Do your intentions have integrity? Or were the things that you had intentions to do consist more of manipulation and getting something for you? No? Me neither. See, missing the mark, like I've already mentioned, separates us from God. And even the last 24 hours, we're unable to maintain holiness or blamelessness. And so Paul is going to continue, and like a lawyer, he's going to drive this point home, and he's going to use this language, A, he's quoting the Old Testament, and he's using language that references like our mouths and our feet, and he's just kind of reiterating the idea that like sin goes all the way down to the roots, like almost like our bodies can't help themselves, which in a way he's kind of echoing Jesus when he's like, hey, if your hand offends, you cut it off, if your eye offends, you pluck it out. That is real, that is in there. He, now he's referring to some like the way we're constantly tempted into some things, especially dealing with immorality. But there's that echoing constantly that's in our nature. So, verse 10. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. That's pretty extreme. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. Star Wars isn't out yet, so Paul did not know that only Sith feel an absolute. Just, there you go. Thank you. Um, their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. That's some harsh language. <laughs> Viper's venom is under their lips. So there's this language that our mouths get us into trouble, that, that we spew forth death. 
that there's, it's full of deceit and poison and bitterness. James says that the tongue is like a rudder of a ship or like a fire, and it's almost uncontrollable. It can be used for good. It can also be used to destroy. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. In, in ancient times especially, I mean, people, your first thought is to go to war. That's the whole idea of your feet are, are swift to shed blood. I mean, there was a whole ancient war over a woman. Troy, anybody? Troy? Yeah. No? Okay, just me. It's all good. It's all good. But think about it in your own life. Somebody, somebody offends you. How quick are you to fight in your offense? How quick are you to turn? Maybe you don't physically fight. But how quick are you with your words, with your intentions, with your actions, with your mighty warrior thumbs on social media? Start tearing somebody down. Or start DMing somebody. Did you hear what they said? Your feet are quick to shed blood. And finally, there is no fear of God before their eyes. So this is people. That's what Paul is saying is this is people. That we are naturally driven to not recognizing God. To not seeking his ways. We're all about us. We're all about worshiping us. It's just full of selfishness. Now, some of you might be like, okay, okay, okay. I, I'm good with that. Like, I get it. I'm a sinner. Cool. But, but, I'm a good, I'm a good person. I can, I can just work really, really good, and it'll outweigh all the bad, right? Like, God will still accept me because, you know, I was kind of the, kind of my mom. I walked the old lady across the street. I'm serving in student ministry. I'm coming to church on Sundays. I said thank you at dinner. Right? Like, if I do enough good things, the, the issue with this is, what's it still about? It's still about you. You've just gone into self-preservation. You've gone into survival. It's you're, you're hoping that on your works, you can abate the wrath of God. That's what Paul says when we're all subject to the judgment. And you're, you're hoping that on your own power, it's still just selfishness, which means your intentions ultimately are still flawed. So the law, this because Paul's anticipating this, Paul's going to talk about the law real quick. So that's what we're referencing here when we say we do enough good. It's because we're going to the law and going, I didn't do this thing unlike that person who did that thing. So watch this, verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law. That's all. So that every mouth may be shut and the whole world will become subject to God's judgment. For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. So the law does two primary things. First, it reveals our sin. That's how we know that what we're in is sin, that we've missed the mark. Because we have the law. Think of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not lie. Okay, who in here can say they haven't lied before? Thou shalt not covet. That means wanting somebody else's stuff. I have, <clears throat> I have seen your shoes, and I have coveted. Okay? Like, that's real. I'm a sinner. Okay? Um, now, we, of course, we get the big one, right? Thou shalt not murder. You would not be in here, to my knowledge, if you had committed murder. Right? So the law reveals to us our sin. And that's just covered in Ten Commandments. There's a whole bunch of other stuff in there. The second one is the law places everyone equal before God. When he says it shuts us up, it shuts the mouths up, it's because we, we can't have an argument. We can't tell God, but, 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 because God looks and he goes, yeah, but only takes once to create imperfection. And so it equalizes all of us. Now humans, us, we will use the law to elevate ourselves over other people. We will use this to elevate, to spiritually bully other believers or people who are trying to get close to the faith. Where you walk around and you're like, did you hear? Did, did, did you hear what they were doing last night with him. I mean, I'm, I'm not doing that. Did you hear? Did you hear how they were at that party and they was smoking crack? I I ain't doing that. I ain't doing you know. Like we're walking around. Hey, hey, you know, I know they're they're drinking. I ain't doing that. I'm I'm just a liar, you know. I'm just a liar. That's all I am. God does not look down at you and go, oh, man, yeah, I think, 
I think I'll let you in because lying is, is better than smoking crack. In God's eyes, he looks at and he goes, did you break my law? Yes. Then it's, you're in sin. I can't be in your presence. It's humans who sit here and do this scale. And then, we, and then all we're doing with it is we're using it to bully each other. Versus going, I'm broken, you're broken. Can we walk towards healing together? Can we walk towards wholeness together? If anything, any of you need to hear in here is quit bullying each other spiritually. And I get it, because I've done the game. I've walked around, and I've looked at other people and been like, I ain't partying, so you know, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves them too. Our journey just looks different. It just looks different. So Paul anticipates that argument. He, he goes ahead and declares us that we're all equal before God, and that we all have sin. And therefore, we're in need of a Savior. That the law doesn't justify. It doesn't help you justify, it's just a review. Think of it like a mirror. You look into it and you're like, ooh, yes, I need to comb my hair, I need to brush my teeth. Now, verse 21, Paul's going to change his tune. I like how it starts. But now. But now. How many of you need a but now in your story? How many of you have been walking down a path for so long that you need to hear that there's a right hand turn coming? That you need a but now. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. So first, there's the righteousness of God. And the righteousness of God became in person as the person of Jesus. And what I love what this verse is saying is that it's available to everybody. You've got a Bible in front of you physically, I would circle that word all. And I love how Paul says, since there is no distinction. He doesn't look on you about your race. He doesn't look on you about your height or your weight or your grade or your GPA, your hair color, the income you come from. And this is how God views you. For all. There is no distinction. I don't care how good you think you are or how bad you think you are. There is no distinction. You can have the righteousness of God placed upon you. And this is good news. Because there are those of us in here who believe God can't love us. Because of whatever thing we did the other night. There are those of us in here who believe that God won't accept us because of the families that we come from. Or the culture we're growing up in. Some of us who believe that based on a laundry list of constant lies, deceit, manipulation, anger, depression, fighting, disobedience, selfishness, need I go on, that we are not welcome in the throne room. But now, powerful two words, your story can change. Through a faith in Jesus to all who believe where there is no distinction, you can have the righteousness of God placed upon you. You won't be chained to your sin or your guilt anymore. So how does this work? How do we receive the righteousness of God? What's the logistics behind it? Verse 23. For all have sinned. We acknowledge that. Paul Club covered that pretty quickly. And fall short of the glory of God. We miss the mark. We are justified. Free. Justified. Made right. By his grace. Grace is the undeserved, unearned, unmerited favor of God extended freely to you through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as an atoning sacrifice in his blood through faith. So God presented Jesus to demonstrate his righteousness so Jesus came and lived a perfect life, and it was approved and affirmed by the prophets who prophesied it. He fulfilled the law. That's what it means when Paul wrote earlier that the law attested to it. It meant Jesus did it. He was fully righteous. He was perfect. And then God offered him up as an atoning sacrifice in his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. 
God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. We can have faith in Jesus. That what he did on the cross counted for us. That's the grace. That's the unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor of God. That he would restrain his wrath and offer this grace and extend it out to you. Atoning sacrifice, that phrase in our translations, and a better word for it would be propitiation. Say that with me. Pro? Pro. Pish? Pish. Piation. Piation. fast. Propitiation. Propitiation. Taught you a new word of me. You can go and pay mommy learn something. Um, propitiation simply means, it's an economic term, it just means paid in full. Paid in full. It, it means that what Jesus did on the cross took our debt, took the fact that we, we can't work our way to heaven, there's no amount of good things that you can do because of separation, and Jesus paid it in full. And then God turns around and freely offers that to you. It's a free gift. What you choose to do with it afterward is completely up to you, whether you choose out of gratitude to begin living a life that reflects God and honors Him. Whether you reject the gift, also your choice, but at the end of the day, He freely offers you salvation. And, and the, the basic reward of the gift of salvation is just eternal life. He freely offers that to you. We owe nothing else. I'd like to invite the band back up. and We're, we're wrapping up right now. Just to wrap up, the question is, okay, so what is salvation? What actually is it? It is the acceptance through faith that Jesus did on the cross for you, for me, that we could not do for ourselves, and that it counted for us. There are a lot of us who are okay with salvation for other people and won't accept it for ourselves. They're still living in this mentality of, oh, all the things that I've done counts for you. Counted for you. He paid your sins in full. It's recognizing that you are a sinner and cannot do anything in your own power to be righteous or to justify yourself before God. And that God justifies you and declares you righteous when you declare that Jesus died for you on your account. And that you accept his free gift. It's received once. You don't have to get saved again. Now, there are times of rededication, there are times where we realize we maybe meander from the path and we choose to rededicate, but salvation itself for your soul at once. Jesus only had to die once. He's not constantly dying for you over and over again. That was the old temple was they bring a sacrifice and then come back the next day and sacrifice again over and over. Jesus died once. He did it once to pay for it all. And then he rose again, which provides it power, and it's for all eternity. Which means that your salvation is good for eternity. No matter what you choose to do with it, if you accept it, it's good for eternity. So tonight, I'm asking something bold here. But if you've never pronounced Jesus the Savior of your life, if you're like, man, I've been around this thing, I've heard the thing, talk about all the time, Justin, shut up already. I'm like, I get it, okay, I'm about Because it's a good, it's good news. This is the good news. This is the gospel. Jesus did for you and I, we could not do for ourselves. But if you've never accepted it for you, not that you're accepting it for the person next to you, not that you're accepting it for somebody up here or back there, but for you in your seat, I'm asking you, I'm inviting you that in your seat, you would just declare in your heart and call out to God, pray to him right there and say that, yes, I am a sinner, but... You love me so much that you would justify me through your son, Jesus. That he would die for me, and I accept that he did for me, and that he counted for me that which I could not do for myself. And if that's you, if that's you tonight, can I ask something? Listen, I believe the Holy Spirit empowers. I believe it gives you confidence. There's no shame in it. Because when somebody comes home, when somebody receives Jesus, there is a party thrown in heaven. And there's a party that's going to be thrown in here. I promise you that when you, if you choose to do this thing, we're going to cheer and we're going to clap in this place. 
We're going to jump up and down. Someone's going to hug you. You might get a sweaty, nasty kiss out there. I have no idea. I don't know your friends, okay? Just saying. But if that's you, if, you're, if you want to accept Jesus, if you in your heart right now in your seat are calling out to him and saying, Lord, save me. If nothing else, because you said it's a free gift, Lord, just save me for eternity. I want you to stand up. I want you to stand up right where you're at. If that's you, stand up. Yes, amen. <laughs> up tonight, please talk to your small group leaders and I would also love to follow up with you. We are so excited for you and you are so loved by your Heavenly Father. You're loved by us in this place and welcome to the eternal family of God. Dear God, thank you so much for these two students. Thank you so much that, that as they called out in their heart that the Holy Spirit came down into them. Thank you for the confidence that they would stand up in front of their friends and proclaim that Jesus is King and that what he did on the cross counted for them. I pray over the conversations to follow in small groups. I, I pray for the questions that might still be asked. I pray that if there's a student tonight who did not stand up, but, but is crying out that prayer, that they come talk to an adult so that we can celebrate with them as you are celebrating in heaven. God, I thank you for the students. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your grace. That even though we don't deserve it or earn it, that you freely give it. That through your son, we are just. She's in that prayer. Amen.